Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today is Dr. James Bridgers, who is the Director of the Department of Health and Human Services. Mr. Sean O'Donnell, Program Administrator, Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response, also for the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Earl Stoddard, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer. And today we have several guests joining us. Mr. Bill Tompkins, who's the President and CEO of the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation, as well as Anthony Featherstone, who is the Executive Director of WorkSource Montgomery. They're both here to talk about unemployment numbers and economic development strategies. Joining us as well is Rebecca Smith, Nurse Administrator, Maternal and Child Health, Public Health Services for the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as Angelina Bell. She's a manager, Babies Born Healthy Program, also for the Department of Health and Human Services. They're here to talk about trends for mothers and babies within our Black community and African American diaspora. Members of the media, remember to raise your hand during the Q&A portions of this presentation. And after this long intro, it is to you, Mr. County Executive. Good afternoon. Thank you Thank for you. joining us, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, so let's get started. So I was going to talk first a little bit about you know the economy. Over the last four years, and despite COVID's interference, we've been focused on supporting our existing businesses, encouraging others to expand here or to come here for the first time, and we're incubating new ones. And I'm happy to report that even in the face of the economic trials from the pandemic, we're seeing indications that our local economy is faring well and doing better than five years ago. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics' latest unemployment data, Montgomery County's unemployment rate stands at 1.5%. This rate is tied for the lowest rate since 1990. And only in December 1999, nearly 23 years ago, actually nearly 24 years ago, did our unemployment rate mirror this level of prosperity. Historically, full employment has always been viewed as um, having unemployment between three and four percent. So we've, I think, set some notable marks right now. Uh, statistical insights from both the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation and Montgomery um, Planning's Economic Indicators briefing for the first quarter of 23 show a year-to-year -year expansion of our labor force with over 8,800 individuals joining the labor force, and employment figures have followed suit with an addition of more than 14,000 jobs to our local economy from March 22 to this past March. We continue to make business-friendly reforms throughout the county. We've embraced changes that permit that simplify permit filings, upgrades, and business establishment procedures. We also have improved our procurement process through digitization and focused on making sure that more local and minority-owned businesses are receiving county government contracts. In fact, for the first time, our Office of Procurement has more new vendors receiving county contracts than previously established vendors. So this is a good sign that we're beginning to get work out to more companies in the county. Montgomery County has an impressive economic landscape. We have the third largest life science workforce in the country. We're home to NIH, FDA, and NIST, and we're part of the third largest biohealth cluster in the United States, as reported by Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. Right now, more than a million square feet of lab space has been built this is since I got elected. And another 3 million square feet is in development to accommodate our life sciences companies. We are a hive of innovation. When I came into office, the number of, of lab space that was being built or the amount that was being built was a big round zero. And we've already seen conversions of empty office space to lab space. Continued good news is that Millipore, Millipore Sigma's expansion project at 218 six, $286 million endeavor set to nearly double its workforce in Rockville. And that is just one of many examples of, of the asset and strategy rich environment we have in Montgomery County. And we're not letting up projects such as University of Maryland's Institute for Health Computing in North Bethesda continues to generate interest and excitement and our local national and international reach, outreach 
is setting this county up for continued excess down the road. While the record low unemployment rate is certainly good news, the data doesn't capture those who cease to search for work or those who are unable to work. Moreover, the unemployment rate doesn't speak to the quality of unemployment. Um, are those people who are earning a living wage with essential benefits like health insurance, or are they getting by at a minimum wage without benefits? Those are the kind, the kind of data you really don't get out of the national numbers. Our approach has to be deliberate. We're going to pave the way for everyone to advance their careers through education, apprenticeships, and workforce training. Institutions like Montgomery College and the universities of Shady Grove play a pivotal role in guiding students to opportunities in the life science markets and other tech markets. And they aid students in charting new courses um, within the workforce, offering continuing education for career advancement. I'd also add that you know, one of the important things that's evolving in Montgomery College and, and USG is the acceptance that you know more people are not going to go to school to get degrees, but can go to school to get certificates. And the certificates are what qualify many people for higher paid, higher skilled jobs in the workforce. So again, it's an evolution of education where the, the college degree is no longer necessary for every good job that's out there. So it'll be interesting to see how this continues to evolve. Montgomery County houses around 33,000 businesses and staggering 95% are small businesses. We've received, we've revitalized our approach, weaving these businesses more intricately into our economic fabric. The creation of our business center, accompanied by grants, workshops, and procurement opportunities has paved the way for more growth. And our small business liaisons are on the front lines assisting business owners in surmounting the challenges they face. We're being proactive, we're knocking on doors to help these people access our local market. Another indispensable tool in our workforce development arsenal is WorkSource Montgomery. We've revolutionized how we help people find work, offering classes in diverse languages and retooling skills for higher paying positions. And I just wanna give a special shout out to WorkSource Montgomery WorkSource Montgomery and Anthony Featherstone because they took an organization which was barely scratching the surface and not doing much to help the people who needed it most and they've turned it into a real dynamo. And uh, that was one of the first things we were able to accomplish in my last term and we did this with the help of the county council because all of us recognized that what we were doing wasn't getting the job done the way we needed to and this change I think has, has been a real sea change for what we do to help people find jobs and help employers find employees. So I'd now like to welcome MCEDC's um, CEO, Bill Tompkins, and Anthony, Anthony Featherstone, who's the executive director of WorkSource Montgomery, to share some of their insights on the work they're doing and the contributions to our economy. So I'll turn it over to Bill and Anthony now. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the county executive has done a great job of summarizing uh, where we're going with the economy. The one and a half percent unemployment rate is just astounding in a good way, mostly good way. It's the lowest it's been, again, since 1990. Uh, what it suggests is that if you're looking for a job and we're trying to keep track of jobs across sectors, whether it be retail or uh, scientific jobs, uh, you can get a job. There should not be a problem getting a job here. And we will uh, look more closely at the types of jobs that are being filled. The labor force is almost back to where it was in 2019. And that is a really, really important thing to know. Uh, we are up to about 543,000 uh, people in the labor force. We were 5 10% below a couple of months ago. And now we're just about right there. So it means that you're seeing people as Mark referenced, coming back into the labor force, whether they had retired early and are deciding to come back or people who had dropped out. So a very good sign there. In terms of uh, scientific and uh, professional jobs, we've grown by 9.4% over where we were before the pandemic. And that's even more compelling. It really shows that we are attracting more people to work here in segments that are important to us, such as life sciences. Uh, the unemployment rate in Washington, D.C., in Montgomery County is lower than any other jurisdiction in the area. 
So there are some things happening here that are clearly moving in our direction. I should note that the new numbers that came out are the preliminary numbers for June. Um, all the other numbers that we have in our report that we will release are confirmed numbers for May and uh, the quarterly numbers will be out right around September 10th. Uh, so things are looking good. Um, a lot of people are probably wondering what's happening with the office vacancy rate. It has gone up. It is around 16%, but it is lower uh, or than Fairfax County, lower than the District of Columbia. So I think we're all suffering in the region, but we're not doing as badly as some of the other jurisdictions. And I can go on and on with statistics but I think what I'd like to, to, to say is that uh, while things are looking good and are looking better, as uh, the county executive said, we're not letting up. We're still going ahead. There are 5,000 companies that we are targeting to help to accelerate their growth, either through expansion efforts or through um, job additions. And that momentum will not stop. So uh, we think things are going to be pretty good this year and it'll be better next year. Uh, so we'll just keep on building our momentum. And now I'll turn it over to Anthony. Um, thank, thanks, Bill. And so um, uh, Anthony Featherstone, Executive Director for WorkSource Montgomery and Montgomery County's Local Workforce Development Board. Uh, for those who don't know um, uh, who we are and what we do, we're the county's lead workforce development organization. Um, we operate directly or indirectly a variety of federal, state, and local workforce development programs. And our, our charge is really twofold. Uh, we want to work with the business community to ensure um, they have the talent to meet their needs today, as well as to understand what their needs are tomorrow. And on the flip side, uh, we work with job seekers to make sure that they have um, an understanding of our local economy. Um, and access to quality training programs of skill so that they can uh, meet the requirements and, and jump into those uh, good jobs that we offer here in Montgomery County. Uh, you know, we, we heard a lot about the unemployment rate uh, here in Montgomery County. I think right now uh, the last number was 8,200 unemployed residents who are looking for work, which is uh, 7,000 less than what we had pre-pandemic in January of 2020. And so uh, the question always comes up, what does workforce development look like when there's such low um, unemployment? And so happy to talk to you a little bit about, about what our, our priorities are as a local workforce development board here in Montgomery County. Um, you know, we're, our, our employment numbers are, are still roughly around 16,000 less than uh, what they were pre-pandemic. And so uh, a lot of what we do is, is geared towards making sure that we can get back to pre-pandemic levels and continue to, to grow. And, and one population that our Workforce Development Board focuses on is uh, discouraged workers. Uh, by definition, the U.S. Department of Labor uh, defines discouraged workers as workers who, who may have searched for work over the last 12 months but have not been active um, over the last four weeks. And uh, they may not be active overall because they believe that there are no jobs out there for them. There may be a le level of barriers and circumstances kind of hindering them from entering the labor market. And so that's what a lot of our, our strategies are uh, geared towards is, is engaging discouraged workers. And, and, and from uh, a research and anecdotes, we know that uh, older workers, ex-offenders or returning citizens, uh, English learners, those with differing abilities and higher levels of barriers uh, are, are typically um, falling within that discouraged worker category. And so uh, we're doing a lot to ensure that uh, we're going out to the public to engage folks through our mobile job center. And we've got a variety of ways that the public can engage with us to uh, to, to embark on a career journey, um, whether it's a, a, a physical job center in Wheaton, uh, Germantown, or in our East County Regional Services Center, or virtual job center that we've stood up as a result of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there's a variety of ways that we uh, can connect with residents that come to us or, or going to them in the community through our, our virtual job center. We, we're also tackling under em, employment as well in the county um, and our, our local county uh, trends mirror what, what's going on in the region. Um, yeah, there, there's certain situations where uh, the population at a certain education level exceeds the, the amount of uh, jobs at, at that level and that, that forces those individuals into um, underemployment. But um, for instance, for, for jobs that require 
associate's degrees, there there are more people at that education level than there are our jobs. And so uh, what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that we uh, are able to connect residents to those training programs so that they can, can upskill and working with individuals who may be underemployed so that they can uh, move into uh, higher wage jobs that are more commensurate with their, their education level. Um, and I think la last but not least, uh, our board is for focused on the, the Alice population. Um, Alice uh, is a term coined by the United Way in our um, United Way of the National Capital Area uh, uh, just notes that, that the Alice population are folks that are um, asset limited, income constrained through employment, but employed. And these are folks that are working and earning wages above the federal poverty level, but still are uh, managing a household deficit budget. And so they're in need of upskilling um, to advance their wages so they don't fall into this Alice population. So a uh, big charge for our, our local workforce development board is to, um, of course, make sure we're engaging the Alice population so that they can uh, increase their skills and increase their earnings long time so we can continue to uh, to move the needle um, forward uh, with, with those that we serve. And so with, with that, I'll, I'll pause and hand it back to you, County Executive. So thank you again, both of you. It's um, it's helpful updating people, I think, on you know where we stand and the work you all are doing, because um, it is clearly making a difference. And I think, again, extend my appreciation, particularly what WorkSource has done, because that's, that's the stuff that people experience on the ground. And I know that what you do is really appreciated. Um, on to other issues we're dealing with. Uh, Mr. County Executive, if, yeah. if, if yeah. I may uh, open it up for Q&A regarding this topic. Um, members of the media, do you have any questions for Mr. Tompkins and or Mr. Featherstone uh, regarding economy? Raise your hand, please. Any questions, members of the media? Oh, there's Katie Shepard, Washington Post. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, I'm not sure um, if you have this data, but do you have a sense of how wages have um, been growing um, as unemployment has been going down? I mean, the, the two things that, that I can speak to, one is that our, you know, our income taxes have been really healthy. And so... You know, and indications are they continue to be healthy. I know we get reports on, um, you know, what is it, the quarterly contributions, um, and things seem to, you know, continue to be improving, be pretty solid. Um, in the last budget, it was, you know, income taxes that helped us buffer the hit to the housing market because, you know, we had increases in income and increases in property values at the same time that we lost you know, revenue from transfer and recordation taxes. So it seems to be generally healthy and we know the minimum wage in the county is now ticked up to, um, six, I think it's 1670 for you know, businesses over 50 and most everybody else is, is at $15 right now. And by January, everybody will be at a floor of no, no lower than 15. And we continue, our wages will continue to increase by inflation after that. So, you know, the signs are it's helpful. And, you know, it's a, I always think of this important because as much as, you know, we have issues with housing prices and particularly rates of return for certain kinds of investment, the other side of the housing crisis is actually a wage crisis. Because if people get paid, you know, if you get paid $15 an hour and you make, 600 a week, you make 30,000 a year, you can only afford a $900 apartment. So anybody who, you look at those numbers and it's like, good luck with that because they don't exist. So there's, you know, wages are part of what we have to deal with when we're trying to provide affordable housing to people. So the better the lift and the, most, the better we can do in terms of ways, raging wage, wages up, um, this little bit of the stress we're able to take off of folks in the housing market who live on more limited wages. Thank you. Any follow up, Katie? No, that was all. Thank you. Any other questions regarding this topic? Members of the media? Once, twice, no more questions. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Featherstone for joining us. You can remain on the call or you can drop off if um, you need to go. Thanks for joining us. Mr. Khan, executive, other topics. So, and speaking of other things that are important, before we go back to you know, strictly county issues, um, I wanted to note the important news made yesterday by Vice President Harris who unveiled a new labor rule that, re that would require, require paying prevailing wages on federal public works projects. This means wages for construction workers on federal projects will be raised, which is long overdue. This rule, the first update to the Davis-Bacon Act of 1931 since 1983, determines how prevailing wages or hourly wages are paid to workers in a given area, how that calculation is done. This new rule restores the Department of Labor's definition of prevailing wage used for nearly 50 years before it was upended by the Reagan administration. It will make the prevailing wage equivalent to the wage paid to at least 30% of the workers rather than 50% of the workers in a given trade in a locality. Prior to the new rule, if the majority of workers in a given trade in the locality didn't earn a single wage rate, then the prevailing wage was determined by the average in a given trade in a locality. Um, this average can pull down the prevailing wage if some employers pay very little. Um, and we have in, in the construction industry, this is not an unheard of thing. Uh, setting the prevailing wage to um, the paid wage of, to, for at least 30% of the workers makes it more likely that workers are traded, paid a true prevailing wage. Our economies thrive on the older prevailing wage rules. Um, higher incomes translate into greater buying power, creating increased economic activity. Decent wages built the middle class of workers in this country who could buy homes and send their kids to college. And, and it improves our tax base as well. This new rule finally corrects one of President's, President Reagan's many attacks on workers, and it will go into effect in about two months, going to improve the livelihood of about 1.2 million workers across the nation. Additionally, this new rule will add an anti-retaliation provision in the contract clauses to protect workers who raise concerns from being fired or punished. It also strengthens the Labor Department's ability to withhold money from a contractor in order to pay employees their lost wages. I especially like that provision. It should not have taken this long to correct, and I appreciate that President Biden's done more for working families in his first three years than any president since FDR, and I mean any. And I hope this new rule will have a positive residual effect on construction and workers in the private sector, as well as our, all hourly employees throughout the nation. On more local work, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about our efforts to reduce maternal health inequities in the county. Uh, right from the start is a program and it's happening this Saturday, August 13th, from noon to 3 p.m. at the White Oak Recreation Center. Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services is bringing together several experts to talk about the importance of preconception health, prenatal care, and early childhood health within the Black African diaspora community. The discussion will be led by Montgomery County Public Health Officer, Dr. Keisha Davis. In 2021, Black women accounted for 43% of all fetal and infant losses in Montgomery County, even though they represented just 20% of all births in the county. That's an indication of ongoing disparities in birth outcomes that we have to confront. Montgomery County has made progress in reducing the health disparities faced by this targeted group, but more work remains to be done to explain what we're doing to reduce our maternal health inequities and explain more about this event on Sunday. I'd like to welcome two special guests, Rebecca Smith, who's a nurse administrator in our maternal and child health division, and Angeline Bell, who is the nurse manager, and she works for Babies Born Healthy program. So thank you both for being here today and your willingness to talk about your roles in this life-saving program. So I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for giving us the chance to speak. Um, in the United States, there are alarming disparities in maternal, mortality and morbidity. The rates between Blacks and African-American women um, uh, women are in, than any other race. The disparities are dramatic in Montgomery County, in the state of Maryland, and in the nation. 
In Maryland, the maternal mortality rate among Black women was almost three times higher than the rest of the population. Okay, I repeat, in Maryland, a Black woman is three times more likely to die as a result of her pregnancy than women of other races. Okay, unfortunately, the same thing can be said about infant mortality and morbidity. In Montgomery County, a baby born to a Black or African American woman is two times more likely to die before its first birthday. Okay, that's why we're talking about this today. Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services is working to improve maternal morbidity rates for all women with a special emphasis on Black women, their pregnancy, and their newborn babies. We have many programs that work with pregnant people and provide education and guidance to ensure health and safe pregnancy and uh, postpartum period for both birthing persons and the baby. To reduce the huge disparities in the African-American population, we have two specific programs, the African-American Health Smile Program and the Babies Born Healthy Program that work um, especially with Black and African-American pregnant families. I am the nurse manager for the Babies Born Healthy Program, and I am proud that we provide home-based care coordination services to approximately 140 Black and African-American pregnant and postpartum women each year. We could serve more. We provide health, um, home visiting, prenatal education, childbirth education, breastfeeding support, parenting support, mental health support groups, we provide transportation to prenatal appointments, community events, and we link clients to community services. We strive to ad address social factors that influence maternal and infant health, such as unstable housing, food insecurity, economic inequalities, and racism to even the playing field um, and to reduce the appalling disparities. I am thrilled to say the programs we're in the programs, we see a great success and we are improving birth outcomes and preventing maternal and infant complications. Um, one of our events, as was, as was mentioned earlier, is coming up this weekend, um, which is Sunday. So just wanna correct, it's Sunday from 12 to 3 p.m. and it's called the Right From The Start event. We welcome all pregnant women as well as families with infants and young children to join us at the White Oak Rec Center on Sunday. Um, all the families can learn about our program and receive information on preconception health because we want to ensure that women know what to do before they get pregnant. Um, we don't want them to wait when they're pregnant before they get pregnant to ensure a healthy pregnancy. Prenatal health is important as well. We wanna make sure they're taking their vitamins, they're eating right, that they're abstaining from drugs and alcohol and they're paying attention to their bodies and also the growing baby inside of them. Postpartum health is important as well. We wanna make sure they know the warning signs such as severe headaches that don't go away, pain, that, they're, that they speak up and they keep talking until someone listens to them, okay? And continue to speak up. Breastfeeding is best. Okay, so we want to support all women to have a successful breastfeeding experience. Child development is important as well. We want parents to know the developmental milestones so they can ask the right questions to their pediatrician. Okay, so that's always important. Mental health, African-American women are a high risk for postpartum depression and need to know how to recognize it, where to go for treatment and support. We want to advocate for the families in Montgomery County and help the moms to advocate for themselves and their babies. It's a matter of life and death for the moms and babies in Montgomery County. Please tell everyone you know about the Right from the Star event, which is this Sunday, uh, uh, August the 13th at the White Oak Rec Center from 12 to 3 p.m. Thank you. Thank you all very much, uh, Ms. Bell. Members of the media, we're going to open it up now for questions regarding this other topic. Please raise your hand if you have any questions for uh, Ms. Bell. And uh, Becky Smith is also here to answer questions. Any questions regarding the right from the start event coming up this Sunday? No questions? 
All righty. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. Um, you can stay on the call or drop off if uh, you need to go. Thanks uh, for being here this afternoon. Mr. County Executive, all the topics and public health update. Yep, I want to thank uh, Ms. Smith and Ms. Bell for uh, their participation this morning. I also want to thank the many partners who will help on the Right from the Start event, including Montgomery County Recreation, the African American Health Program, and Early Childhood Services. And I also want to express my appreciation for the leadership on this issue uh, at the state level from Governor Moore's administration, the Maryland General Assembly leadership, and our Montgomery County State Delegation for their work last session on passing the Healthy Babies Equity Act. And I hope you will please promote our Right From The Start program this Sunday so people know about it. And again, you know, in a world of diminishing newspaper coverage, um, everything we can do to get this word out is important. And the media can play an important role in helping us inform our residents of what's happening. Um, on other uh, health news, uh, COVID rates are increasing. We've seen a slight uptick in our COVID rate, and this is a reminder that COVID is still out there. People are getting sick just this week. I had a lunch that had to be canceled because one of those who was planning to attend came down with COVID. Uh, it's not the first person I've talked to who's come down with COVID recently. So it's still out there. Today's seven-day cumulative case rate is now 16.56 per 100K which is similar to last week and a mild increase from the previous four months. So we continue to tick upward. If you just look at the, uh, the statewide acute beds occupied um, by adult COVID patients, it's about a 50% increase from the 76 in, uh, at the end of July to um, 123 on um, August 7th. So. The number clearly is, is moving in the direction we prefer it not to move. Additionally, the number of acute care patients with a COVID-19 diagnosis has increased as well. As you can see from this chart, Maryland had 78 patients in acute care, ICU and ICU from COVID at the end of July. Now they're 123. Um, that's just in over a little over two weeks. Montgomery County had 18 acute care and zero ICU patients with the COVID diagnosis on Monday. Uh, we see this, inc we also see an increase in our wastewater surveillance, as you can see from this chart, which corresponds to our clinical data that COVID is more elevated in our community. So we're seeing in the wastewater um, as well. Although our CDC community level remains low, we can't ignore these increases, which is why we continue to monitor and talk about these rates. So we urge all the residents to be mindful the COVID's still with us, and as we conclude our summer vacations and gatherings while preparing to go back to school, um, everybody needs to be aware of the situation. Um, you know, as we move into fall, more activities are going to be back in closed quarters, children re return to school buildings, and so the likelihood of greater opportunities to contract or spread COVID, you know, will increase. So just everybody should be aware that it's going to be time for your new booster shots. If you haven't had a booster shot in the last, for, I guess, four or five months or six months, um, there are new boosters coming out this fall. So uh, when they're available, they're targeted on the latest strains of COVID and are no longer going to be bivalent, as I understand it. So they'll be targeting the strains that we're all dealing with right now. Um, I'm going to stop there and turn it over to... Uh, uh, Sean O'Donnell, um, who's our public health emergency preparedness manager, to talk more about um, health issues. It's all yours, Sean. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. So, again, just to follow on with what we we mentioned last week, um, we are seeing the those increases in the the wastewater surveillance, as our county executive pointed out, which. Um, will will likely mean that there is COVID going on in, in the background. There may be some increases in the, the coming weeks or so. Um, we've seen the test positivity rise across the state um, at a, a slow rate. It's not going up quickly, um, but again, just showing that there's increased uh, COVID transmissions. And when you look, again, these are the daily levels. We tend to report the, the weekly levels. Um, but these were all under one uh, case per 100,000 uh, 
two weeks ago. Um, and most of them are now have now risen. So it's not just in Montgomery County, um, across uh, across Maryland, we're, we're seeing um, some uh, increased transmissions. Looking at our, our particular hospitals in Montgomery County, um, we've seen a, a mild increase in the number of patients with a COVID diagnosis. Um, it doesn't mean all of them are there because of COVID, uh, but we are seeing that um, have, have increased a little bit. And then uh, looking at the emergency department visits, we have not seen an increase in those, those visits, um, which is good news. Um, likewise, we have not seen any significant increases um, or, or, or large increases in respiratory illness, flu-like illness at the hospitals. So not just limited to COVID. Um, we're getting we're getting closer once we go back to uh, school, we're getting closer to that respiratory disease period. Um, so we'll be looking at, uh, in addition to COVID, uh, influenza, RSV, some of the other things. I just wanted to share again, um, over the last few months, we've only had one month um, with more than 10 deaths in Montgomery County. Um, those are the, the smaller blue lines, the gray lines are the deaths um, related uh, to COVID uh, in this, across the state. So we've had much lower levels, um, but to put it in perspective, because I'm going to share with you some influenza data uh, for the past year, you, you can see that even um, this past winter, which was a, a more mild COVID than previous winters, we still had, um, it, you know, between 30 and 50 deaths a month in Montgomery County um, related to COVID. When we look at uh, the Maryland influenza activity for the entire year, uh, there were 69 deaths across the entire state. So COVID is still um, causing significantly more serious illness than things like the flu. Um, we do recommend both flu shots and uh, there should be an updated flu shot this fall as there is most years and there'll be an updated COVID shot. Um, both should be available around the same period, maybe at the end of September or early October. Um, so we'll we'll continue tracking these and reporting these out uh, so that uh, the public is aware of what the, the risks are from these different uh, public health diseases. At this point, I'd like to see if Dr. Bridgers or Dr. Stoddard have any additional items to add. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell, none for me. None for me as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Members of the media, we open it up now for Q&A, public health update, and any other questions, please raise your hand. There's Jeannie Bixby, MOCO 360. Good afternoon, uh, Jenny. Um, good afternoon. Um, hi, Mark. I have kind of a question unrelated to all of this, but thought I'd catch you now. Um, I'm working on a story about council member Kristen Mink's track record because, you know, she's drawn a lot of attention um, in recent months. And I was just kind of wondering about what your experience has been in working with her on the rent stabilization and things like that. I I think, you know, you're going to get a long drawn out answer that everybody else may not be interested in. So how about you call me and you can actually talk to me about that. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. I'm kind of around, so you can talk to Scott and uh, we'll have that conversation. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Janie. Any other questions, members of the media? All right. Going once, twice. No more questions? I guess uh, we're done for today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Stay safe, and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great afternoon. Take care.